welcome to the uh, IT subcommittee. Uh, the uh, first uh, thing we'll deal with is uh, declarations of interest. Are there any? No. Oh. Okay. Confirmation of minutes of the meeting of the 27th of April. Okay, carried. Okay, status of information technology subcommittee inquiries and motions for the period ending the 22nd of November. Okay. Received. Received. Draft operating capital budget for ITSC. So we'll move into that right now. Pardon me. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, Mr. Bashir? Yeah. Sure. So, motion uh, by Councillor Weeper to add the um, IPD, and that's carried? Yes, yeah. carried. Well, okay. <laughs> Okay, so now back to the back to the budget. Thank you, Chair, and committee members for giving us the opportunity to share uh, activities of IT in 2017 and some of the work plans for next year. Um, our bread and butter on a daily basis in IT continues to be providing critical technology services to the corporation. Um, this includes the back-end infrastructure, a couple of data centers, a thousand plus servers, storage systems, and the work that goes on to connect the 350 plus facilities across the city. Uh, we maintain a reliable inventory of computers, around 12,000 of them, and we life cycle about 15 to 20% of them each year. Uh, we give a high degree of focus on perhaps the most popular technology tool in the organization, which is the email system. So we make sure that it's running and secure all the time. Uh, speaking of security, it, there are a few stats in front of you on the slide. Uh, a recent partnership that we have with a third party managed service provider around security is already yielding many positive results. Uh, we are now able to analyze a whole bunch of more data a lot faster, and we're only actioning on really true cyber threats. Uh, to give you an example, over the last three months, there were 20 billion logs of data that were analyzed, uh, out of which there were 8,000 events that required some further investigation. And only in 18 of those cases, one eight of those cases, did staff at the city had to do some additional due diligence on our end. Uh, so that partnership, uh, we believe, is, is definitely worth the investment that we have made and something that we are going to uh, look to expand and, uh, in the coming years. Um, excellent client service is something which is central to how we want to deliver IT services. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the things that uh, is, is about client service is providing multiple channels to our clients. Uh, we are talking about 70,000 plus requests that we receive through our 24-7 service desk. Another 75,000 requests were processed through the web portal. And thousands of clients are making use of the in-person support channels. Uh, my favorite stat on this slide is actually one that is perhaps the least known even within IT, and that is the 1.7 million times uh, per month the enterprise service bus was called upon to exchange data between a multitude of different independent applications. And think of that as the information highway for IT, uh, which is making sure that all of the information goes back and forth between the various applications. Um, SAP uh, is a critical system, as we all know, enterprise-wide, and is keeping the many back office functions running. Uh, the number of SAP transactions, as you see on the slide, are quite high. And despite the perhaps not so user-friendly experience of the system itself, uh, the technology continues to be a very reliable one for us. Uh, what this slide also demonstrates to us is the behind-the-scenes technology that needs to take place 
in order for a number of various applications throughout the city that are delivering critical business services. Uh, this slide here, uh, uh, committee members, is intended to give us a flavor of some of the project work that we undertook in 2017, which is beyond our operational work plan. So we now have a physical service center up and running at 110 Laurier, and it's gaining quite a bit of popularity among staff in this building. Uh, we are in the midst of testing a, a, a live agent chat pilot, which we expect to roll out early in the new year. Uh, you would have all heard about Office 2016 rollout that was done throughout the corporation for about 12,000 users in record time with uh, minimal issues. The same can be said about the, the 3,000 or so BlackBerry phones that were migrated to either the Android or the Apple platform. A variety of software solutions were put in place that you see under deployments. Uh, particularly, I want to mention SAP Fury, uh, which is uh, the new way of uh, delivering services through using SAP uh, to make it a lot more user-friendly and accessible. Uh, one example is now we have the ability for thousands of workers, uh, seasonal workers of the city, to do time entry directly into the SAP system using a Fiori app, uh, which has reduced a lot of manual time entry processes. Um, a few major application upgrades took place that uh, probably touched almost everybody in the corporation. A number of infrastructure initiatives were completed in 2017. Uh, including enhanced Wi-Fi in this building and a few others. Uh, a number of data center upgrades were completed, including adding power supply equipment redundancies, server life cycles, new storage systems. Um, there was a considerable effort that took place also in terms of updating our policies, adding new standards, new procedures such as cloud framework. Um, and so, as you can see, 2017 was a pretty busy year for IT. Uh, we started the year with a new management team uh, that had to make sure that there was stability at the staff level after the reorg. And I'm happy to report that we are ending 2017 on a very high positive note. There is a high level of collaboration amongst IT staff and with our stakeholders. Uh, we are communicating now with uh, our clients in a way that perhaps we have never done before. And lastly, in 2017, uh, we had an aggressive focus on retooling and, and uh, skills development for IT staff, uh, particularly around the idea that we need to reduce our reliance upon professional services when it comes to doing operational matters in IT. Uh, the good news is that 2018 is shaping up to be an even exciting year, even much more exciting year for us. Um, the, uh, we have a better understanding in IT of the work plans ahead of us. Uh, and in many cases, I can say that we have regained some of the trust and confidence with our clients and stakeholders. If I look at the work plan, uh, generally speaking, you can theme it around modernization. And around modernization, we're talking about modernization of tools, processes, and people. Uh, modernization of tools perhaps is most easy to understand because it is quite tangible. Uh, and uh, it can be well defined. Uh, we have a number of business applications that are slated to be life cycled in 2018. Uh, several hardware related initiatives are ready to go. A number of enterprise wide systems have to be upgraded like the Windows operating system. For those of you who don't like Windows 10, sorry to say, but it is coming to all of us next year. Uh, SAP, uh, and on all of that is going to mean that a higher level of attention needs to be put uh, on our infrastructure. Uh, we have a strong need from our clients uh, regarding more collaboration tools, specifically that are mobile enabled. Uh, we all know that there are lots of trends upon us, like Internet of Things, uh, which means that there's going to be an exponential rise in terms of how many devices are connected to the network. And we want to be smart about it by uh, taking a platform approach uh, versus adding you know, independently managed hundreds of cloud-based applications. Uh, modernization of processes is key. You know, you can have the best technology in hand, but you need to have the right processes to leverage value out of them. And for us, that means agile project management techniques. It means DevOps practices for software development. It means a more disciplined approach when it comes to quality assurance. 
It also means that uh, IT service management practices have to be put in place. And uh, really the simple way of thinking about that is on a daily basis there are technical routines that any IT shop does, uh, similar to ours. And if you don't fine tune them, that's the easiest way to kill productivity in an IT shop. So that will be a big focus for us as well. Uh, the last thing around process modernization is vendor management. We want to be on top of road mapping technologies with some of our key vendors so that we can minimize surprises for our business clients. Modernization of people and skills, for me, uh, that perhaps is what will make or break the multi-year work planning that we are doing currently at the city. Uh, in 2017, as I mentioned earlier, we had a concentrated effort to provide technical training to every ITS staff that wanted it. And it wasn't just any training, we are talking about providing them the premier level of technical training that companies like Disney and Microsoft and Google and big top banks offer to their employees. Uh, you know, just in the last several months, we've been able to offer thousands of hours worth of technical training to IT staff. Uh, that has been really the first when it comes to uh, uh, this particular focus area. In 2018, we want to continue that focus, and the idea is that the skills need to keep pace with the changing technology around us. A few last things worth mentioning on this slide uh, include, uh, we are heavily invested in supporting elections 2018. As you probably appreciate, the elections run off a whole bunch of technology working in the background, so we are all in, and we are doing whatever it takes to, to make sure that that is uh, going to work as per plan. Uh, we are introducing a collaboration tool, MS Project Online, for many staff members of the city who are looking for a less complex tool, project management tool. Uh, we are also going to continue the work that we have already started with uh, supporting the digital strategy for the city. There are many exciting initiatives over there, and all of them are hand in hand with the modernization efforts that IT is, is pursuing as well. And the last thing worth mentioning is SharePoint, which we are introducing early in the new year as an enterprise-wide file sharing tool. Uh, the slide here talks about the increase in budget in 2018 that is proposed from this year. And as you can see from the slide, it's a combination of cost of living adjustments, uh, changes to benefit changes, uh, the contract fees that we have to pay on various systems that we have long-term contracts on, and there are annual uh, maintenance increases on those. We're also planning to spend the money if we were able to get the increase on things like security tools, on proactive monitoring of our systems and of our applications, and uh, doing some updates to our uh, data centers as well. This slide here is, uh, uh, is talking about the capital budget. Uh, the Microsoft Upgrade project is uh, what is going to help us get to Windows 10. And by going to Windows 10, it's unfortunately not as simple as just updating every window operating system. A lot of other associated programs also have to be updated. For example, Exchange, uh, the system that runs our email has to be upgraded, and a bunch of other uh, related software systems. So uh, that uh, capital line item that you see is for those types of items. The technology infrastructure line item is going to cover a number of uh, uh, items related to us getting ready for the cloud. Uh, we are looking at uh, uh, doing uh, a, a big migration of one of our data centers. Uh, it won't happen in one go because there is going to be otherwise a big uh, impact to the business, but we are going to stage it in such a way so that we can uh, exit one of our data centers fully to the cloud. Uh, and I believe uh, this might be the last slide. Um, I'll leave that in case uh, SIPD, you wanted to add anything, or maybe for later, sure. And I was asked to correct one thing on this slide here. Uh, the big uh, pie, uh, which says revenue, 13.026 million, uh, that I believe is uh, from tax-funded sources. And I think that is the end of my presentation, Mr. Chair. Thanks very much. So questions from the committee? Who's going first? Does anybody? Okay. Yeah, well, that's right.
Thank you, Mr. Chair of uh, Council. Um, so okay, just will, will this be on the budget first or the budget yeah, we'll, and the IPD together? Uh, well, we're, we're talking about the budget, right? Okay, right. So you can go with the budget now. Um, uh, okay, so uh, my background is I've managed um, uh, a department in a high-tech company uh, of up to 100 people. So I have some uh, background in managing uh, finances. Um, uh, I, I want to make a few comments, a few suggestions on what I've seen. Um, I'm going to make a few assumptions because the documents that I was given uh, prior to this meeting weren't very detailed, even though I, I asked for some more information at the uh, pre-budget meeting that where I attended in Canada. So it looks like uh, we're going to do a lot of uh, work on Microsoft upgrade. In the documents it says uh, Office is going to be upgraded, but it looks like Office is already done. So um, I'm not a bit confused there. but. Um, in terms of uh, you know being on a support platform, that's uh, very important. Um, but did we consider uh, you know use of open source tools in any of these things that might uh, change the, the cost envelope? Um, you know, do all of the um, you know desktops need Office, or um, do we look at you know maybe having uh, SharePoint hosted in the cloud rather than deploying SharePoint ourselves? Um, in terms of uh, asset upgrades, uh, obviously keeping up with the latest technology is uh, costly, and but it's also important. So uh, in the budget, it's not clear about what is the refresh cycle of the different kinds of assets. So you mentioned that you replace uh, 15 to 20 percent a year, but uh, you know what's the refresh cycle for a laptop versus a telephone versus a network switch versus you know all the other kinds of assets. So it might be. Um, we might be able to look at shifting around numbers in the budget by extending the life of one kind of asset or, or another. Um, the uh, digital services strategy, I've seen it mentioned a few times, and uh, the proposal is to spend $1.2 million on it, but I don't know what the digital services strategy is. I haven't seen a draft. There's nothing referenced in any of the budget documentation. So it might be good. I hope it's good. Um, but. You know, my confidence on uh, what to spend $1.2 million on is, uh, is not there yet because I don't know what the details. So do we have a release date for the DSS? Uh, in terms of uh, SAP or other backend systems, um, in my interactions with staff, it's very clear that there's no good tracking system for tracking um, uh, requests that don't come through 311. So, um, uh, I've been working with some staff members and they say, you know, please don't open a 311 request for this. I'm not sure why. But so then all the interactions are tracked by email. Well, that's not a very good tracking system. So, uh, you know, I, I've put requests in on uh, Ottawa.ca, filled in the comments. I don't know what happens to those things. They just go in a black hole somewhere. So it'd be great if we had a back-end system to, to track that kind of information uh, or requests, and I didn't see anything in any of the budget documents related to that. Um, so uh, in terms of where I'd like to see more money, um, there's no projects related to the open data portal. Um, the open data portal was down for four days recently. Uh, not sure why. Um, there was no real communication about that, so um, more, more activity or a specific project line item so I can understand more about what's going on with the uh, open data portal. Um, and, um, and that's about it. So uh, it would be great to get more details about uh, some of the items in the budget. I understand we don't want to make the budget documents huge, but certainly you know, the slides that were presented here were very helpful uh, in understanding some of those items. And I know, um, you know, the, the budget, the way we do budgets in the city is something in, something out, so we don't want to increase the budget, but, you know, there's not really enough details for me to say which things to that I might want to remove versus uh, to put more money in. So, thank you. Okay, before I get uh, Mr. Bashir to answer, I just wanted to, could you explain a little further um, your comments about our tracking that we have when you... Um have dealt through 311, and you asked you asked uh, where that goes. I can tell you it doesn't go here. 
<laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, sure. So, uh, so there's multiple ways to provide feedback to the city on, you know, various requests. You can, you can open it through on one request. You can go on the city website and you can click the feedback button, uh, which then generates an email to somebody. You can go on the open data portal, same thing. You can generate a feedback request and it goes to somebody. Uh, or, of course, you can just send email to various staff people. So uh, I, I haven't seen a way that all of those, okay, I know how three on one works and those things are tracked, but the other methods, I don't know where they're tracked or how they, they appear. So I would really like to see if I open a request on the Ottawa.ca that that actually just in turn in the background generates a three on one request and then it's just handled, um, you know, the same way that that would work. Uh, that's an easy way to track it, that's an example. All right, so Mr. Bashir, did you have? <coughs> No, that's okay. I, All right, then questions from committee to delegation. Council Wilkinson. I was interested in what you said about the open data and the, uh, the portals. I, I know you use it a lot. Um, are you finding that there are some things that are missing there or is it more difficult? Or what, what's the issues that you're getting with the open data specifically? Uh, um, I guess uh, related to the open data portal, I I've seen uh, some quality related issues. So for example, uh, it was great to see uh, that the collision data was released uh, openly a, a few weeks ago. But then I started looking through uh, the data and like there's some collisions that are not even within the city when you look at the latitude longitude. But when you look at the street address, it's in there. So which one's right? I don't know. Um, so. Uh, yeah, there are various uh, quality related issues, I would say. I mean, always we need more open data, more open data is better, but I'm not sure that there's enough staff time spent verifying that the data that's provided is correct. Um. Okay, well, thank you. Thank you for the work that you've been doing to uh, work on this. I know I get copies of what you send to staff quite often, and the uh, and uh, you're actually, this, Mr. Chair, this is one of the people that actually is trying to support and assist the city in making their systems better, as opposed to just criticizing, which is rather nice and refreshing. Okay. So thank you for what you're doing that way, Matthew. Thank you. Okay, okay. Councilor Reaper. Um, I'll pick up on uh, um, uh, Chair Shirelli's um, uh, question. When you're going to Ottawa.ca and you're typing in feedback and you're wondering where it's going, what kinds of things are you uh, putting in there? Because there are, there's different classifications of what you might send to the city. Some things, you know, three on one is intended uh, for something that requires follow up and uh, it generates some kind of an action. And personally, I prefer to see those go through three on one uh, myself. What are you sending to the city and you're wondering where it's going? What kind of nature of requests? Uh, yeah, so the, the things that I would submit on the Ottawa.ca would be like, you know, there's a spelling error on the website or there's a mis missing information or something. Or the other one that, uh, that I submitted was my 311 request was mishandled. Um, so, you know, can somebody get back to me on that? Which somebody eventually did after a few months. But so in an ideal world, you would see that at some point you can see your request that your, you know, for a, a review of however your 311 request was handled would become part of a, a data set moving forward. Right, exactly. So, you know, if I have a request to fix a spelling error on the city website, that should be tracked as a request, and then I can see that the issue is closed when the spelling issue is resolved. So rather than sending me emails back and forth, it would be great if it was in a system, and then I could just, you know, see what was going on. Interesting. So would, would you uh, oppose being asked to do a through one request for that type of uh, ever request? No, that would be fine. I mean, as long as like the three one would just be pushing people more into it. Okay. No, I, I'm quite happy to use the three on one request system when it works properly. <laughs> Thanks, Matthew. All right. Is this for staff? Okay, Councillor Chen. Great. Uh, thank you. And you know, we've spoken before in the past, and and I think. Uh, you know, from an open data perspective, now we're up to 149 data sets. I, I applaud staff for the great work on that. I mean, back in 2011, when we really f started getting the rubber to the road, I, we barely had any. And I think we made that uh, agreement that if there's an opportunity to be able to create the data feeds to provide, whether it's XML or raw data, 
we're, we're actually staff are actively working on that, so kudos to staff. Uh, you did make mention of open source software. I'm going to express where there's pitfalls with that. It sounds great and it sounds like a cost savings, but it typically never is. Uh, the city of Edmonton actually went to an opus, uh, open uh, office environment, uh, quickly realizing it was a bad move. It actually hit the full council table and they ripped it out and went back to uh, a Microsoft world. And the reason behind that is simply training and what people are using. And, you know, when you have over 14,000 employees in the organization, Change is difficult, but I did want to give you assurances and I want to get feedback from you in regards to a major, I'd, I'd say leading edge uh, move by our city to go to open source when it comes to our website and using Drupal. Uh, what's your opinion on that? Do you think this is the correct direction for our city to go? Uh, I'm not a Drupal expert, but certainly um, there's many organizations using Drupal uh, in that fashion and I've seen many you know, national governments um, you know, Australia, New Zealand, uh, etc., uh, sure. United States. So uh, Drupal is a uh, very common platform to build a website. It's, you know, accessible. It has um, multilingual support, all the things that, you know, we expect from a modern uh, web development platform. That's wonderful. Thank you. And, and just as a follow-up, just so you know, I, I have spoken to staff several times. I have spoken to the chair. Uh, we also believe in open data because you guys are doing the work for us for free. You're creating the apps. You're creating, you're creating the, uh, the websites that uh, make use of the data to be able to generate reports and, 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 and different applications that we simply don't have the resources to do. So uh, if it gives you some kind of um, assurance that uh, we think this is the way to go and we'll continue pressing that way. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. All right, thank you for the, for the presentation. Now, uh, Mr. Bashir. Just uh, a couple of points uh, to Matthew's uh, feedback and then I'll pass it on to my SIBD colleagues. Uh, Matthew, you, you very rightly mentioned that uh, it does say, I'm just going to go to the right slide here, Microsoft upgrade. Um, and you're right that the Office 2016 upgrade has uh, completed in 2017, but related to Microsoft is the Windows 10 and the Microsoft Exchange upgrade that needs to happen next couple of years. And maybe, maybe the title might have been misleading a little bit. Um, I didn't realize, Matthew, that you, that, uh, you know, he has uh, a lot of good experience uh, in terms of leading uh, an IT shop, and uh, I'll definitely be Mr. Chair picking his brain on, on a few different things. I'll pass it on to my colleagues in SIPD about open data. Thank you, Sad. I, I think we generally support what you're saying, and uh, I don't think there's Is anything there? else I, I have to add. Thanks. All right, thanks very much. Uh, we'll bring it back into committee uh, for questions of staff, uh, beginning with Councillor Tierney. Uh, great. Uh, first of all, thanks again, Said. I think I've, I've noticed a, a, a big difference in the last year. You've, you've really focused on the business aspect of things, which is critical in this organization. Uh, one thing that jumped out at me, I remember very clearly in 2014 uh, when we had the dancing banana on our website. Uh, and I think that identified, and it was also identified by our AG, that uh, security uh, is paramount. Uh, I know we've made some major changes, and I'm just looking at some of these numbers here. Um, in a three-month period, 16.5 thousand quarantined uh, emails. Um, there's just a whole series of attacks and malicious behavior that's out there that, frankly, we weren't really dealing with the way we could have until we brought in CGI. Do you feel there's a major benefit to what they're doing? And part two to that is the DDoS attacks, the uh, denial of service attacks. Uh, I don't see that, forgive me if the stats are there and I'm just missing them. Uh, I think we made a major move by making changes back when we were feeling that same pressure and people were trying to take our site down, as well as Ottawa Police. Uh, are we staying on top of that to ensure that we're in a good position from a security perspective? Um, thank you, Councillor, for that question. Uh, on your first question about our partnership with CGI, uh, we definitely are, I think, on the right track in terms of identifying and quarantining a lot of these issues that are surfacing. I, I do want to share that the kinds of stats that you see here for the city of Ottawa are not very different from what you see for any other similar size public sector organizations. 
and every on a daily basis the network is uh, being a target uh, sometimes of amateur level and sometimes it's a bit more professional uh, but in each one of those cases you know the confidence that i am i'm sharing with you is that we have been able to identify those and, and quarantine them prior to this uh, partnership being put in place you are correct that uh, we would have been doing a lot of scrambling and and the one real benefit that has come out of this is that we are now focused on the real cyber threats. There are lots of false alarms that happen in the world of security that can take up a lot of time of IT staff. Um, on your second question about the, uh, the DDoS attacks, uh, we do have a state-of-the-art uh, solution, uh, technology solution in place that protects the city from uh, you know, anti-DDoS attacks. And uh, I did not include that stat number. I don't have it right now on me. I can certainly share it afterwards. Sure. But again, uh, we feel pretty confident that that particular solution is doing it. That's wonderful. And, and I, I know firsthand uh, what CGI does because they're actually a business in my ward. And if anyone's ever taken the opportunity to go look at their their, um, their, their uh, I'll call it their war room, for a better lack of a word. Um, they have many, many screens, and you can see how many malicious attacks online are, are taking place all the time. Um, and I, I, I think that was probably one of our better investments to date. Um, I did want to look at uh, two other things that I, I noticed that I think are going to save this corporation a lot of money. Uh, one, uh, SharePoint. Uh, I think this is a great move that uh, we're actually moving into this realm. Uh, I'm just wondering how are we going to make sure that we can get the business units to pick up on using that and just for the audience and people that might not know what SharePoint is and I did a lot of SharePoint work back in the day, um, now you have the ability to have workflow. So for example, if you actually uh, have uh, some, something that has to be actioned, if it's not actioned, it will bump it to the next level of management or, or to uh, an employee. Those kind of tools are so valuable because it will ensure that there's follow-up on whether it's uh, producing reports or just uh, some day-to-day -day operations. How are we going to ensure that the business unit makes use of that? Uh, Councillor, you bring up a fantastic point that without good governance around SharePoint and how you're actually going to use it, it may just become another data repository tool, which in itself is a big deal. It's going to solve a lot of other issues for us. Uh, but uh, uh, we are plan at this point in time, we are piloting the SharePoint solution within IT and a few select client groups. Uh, we are going to be rolling it out in the early new year, in the first quarter of next year. And the idea is to bring some external expertise for us so that we can uh, make SharePoint part of a lot of the business processes within the corporation. So I think uh, if I were to come back to this group sometime in Q2 of next year, I would be able to give you an update on how are we promoting and propagating the value of SharePoint in the corporation. That, that's wonderful. And as, if there's any guinea pig opportunities, uh, I would certainly love to be a part of that because you can set basic rules, simple rules to say, if someone hasn't actioned this item within two days, email this person. Or three days, escalate to this person. Those are very valuable tools because we're all very busy and we have a lot of things going on and those reminders are critical. Um, I also noticed something else that, that I thought is very important and I brought this up as an inquiry last year and made actually part of my, my, my uh, 2014 uh, platform was the whole idea of project management and MS project. This is critical in my mind. Uh, the fact that we've had Excel spreadsheets being used on desktops that aren't versioned uh, creates a lot of confusion and I've seen projects where you have two different Excel spreadsheets being out there creating problems on certain projects, even in my own area. Uh, this will be centralized. It will allow for Gantt charts. It will allow for uh, uh, resources, uh, whether it's employees or otherwise, to all be tracked and used in one central location so there's no confusion across the board. Uh, I guess the same question is there, how are we going to ensure, is this going to be through a project management shop? How are we going to make sure that people actually start to use this wonderful tool that's there and get away from using Excel spreadsheets? Um. Councillor, we are planning to, similar to SharePoint, uh, heavily promote the use of MS Project Online. The nice thing is it's built on the SharePoint platform as well, so there's a lot of consistency in terms of sharing of files related to projects because it's the same file sharing system on the other side. Um, you know, we are looking at potentially 
providing uh, some complementary licenses as well to Project Online for some of the key groups. But from all of the conversations I've had with many different user groups in the city, there is pent up demand to start using this tool as soon as we roll it out. So I don't think we'll have a hard time in promoting that particular one. This is, this is great news. Mm -hmm. I may have more questions later on, Mr. Chair, but that's it for now. All right, just uh, bouncing off of Councillor Cheney's earlier questions, how many malicious attack attempts have we had in the last three months or the last year? About 1,600 attempts to, uh, to compromise the city's network. In each one of those cases, uh, we were able to quarantine them. Uh, you know, in the last three months, we got around 13 and a half million spam messages. Um, many of them would have been uh, containing different types of viruses. All of them were quarantined. Uh, and uh, 16 million accesses, um, you know, uh, most of them, if not all of them, are, uh, are, are not really by design. It's, you know, you're trying to access a certain website, and that same website tries to open up other windows on your screen. I'm sure many of us have had that uh, situations. And those types of uh, situations, 16 million of them in the last three months were blocked as well. Councillor Wilkinson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, Russ, for all of this information. One of the things that in the past we had a bit was we had some roadmaps to show how we we're going to move forward in technology. And for those of us like me who are not really as tech savvy as, as Tim or some others, is a really good way to see what the impact of the technology is going to be as opposed to what the technical word of it is. And I think that it would be helpful if we could get some sort of an idea of, I, I've talked a bit about it today, about where we're going and how we're going to get there. Because I looked at how much you have in your capital budget, and to me it seems to be quite small when you consider what's happening in the world in technology. And I know you've been catching up and improving some things and spending a lot of time on security, which is essential. But I think somewhere along the line in the next year, it would be very helpful to get a sort of a roadmap. And at that point, we had one for the city, and we had a separate one for OC Transport, which has very different needs, but they're very technology-oriented now. I mean, bus drivers have to be IT specialists almost now. Uh, and it, it really was helpful, as I'm on Transit Commission as well, to understand how that's happening when we get people saying, why can't you do this? Or why doesn't the, the work system work to tell me when the bus is coming? It turned out because they changed the thing and they changed the route and it takes a little while to get it started. I mean, there's a whole series of things. Is it possible to get something like that happening in a, at a future meeting? Um, Councillor, uh, your, your two questions, one about the budget and one about the roadmaps. On the roadmaps, um, it is on our work plan to deliver uh, technical roadmaps for each one of our key enterprise systems. Uh, and again, if you invite me again this time, uh, not this time, but Q2 of next year, uh, we would certainly be able to share with you probably well before then the technology roadmaps for the various systems and how is that going to impact from a business perspective. Uh, we'll take away the whole technical jargon out of it. So that's definitely in the works. It's something that we have already started. The documentation is quite fragmented. And one of the things that we did with the reorg was we created a group of people that are part of the technology modernization branch, and that is their singular focus to take a look at that big picture all the time. On the budget, uh, uh, Councillor, I believe that we have uh, quite sufficient dollars really to, to spend uh, over the next little horizon that I can see. You know, uh, there has to be also a, a, an acknowledgement of the capacity of change that IT can also bear. And I think with all the various things that we are planning to do, with all the systems that we are planning to upgrade, I think we, we would be in a lucky place if we can achieve all of the things that I have in front of you on this slide. Yeah. So I remember hearing from some before too that in our IT department here is about 90, 95% looking after things and very little looking at what we call like forecasting future needs and things, and it should be a much better balance in those two. Are you getting more time to actually think about, get out of the, the doldrums of making the system work? Because you've done a lot of work on that this last year from what you've just presented to us, to actually looking towards the future you can have the city being far more efficient in its operations, instead of like you're doing right now with the, uh, the sharing, um, to, uh, to so that we can, you can actually do that and, not, and, and also get senior management to see how this can improve the whole city operations. 
Right. And that takes time. You need some thinking time, some time to do research and things, etc. And not just yourself, but some of your team. Is that in the, in the program now? Uh, Councillor, uh, it would be very easy to have everybody in IT work on nothing but operations on any given day. Uh, so part of my job and my management team's job is to make sure that we are uh, forcing in many cases uh, people to think about automation, to think about machine learning, to think about uh, performance monitoring, a lot of those things that uh, can take up a lot of uh, you know, uh, laborious time. Um, there's a long list of various tools that we already currently have, but we haven't been fully able to leverage their automation aspects. There are those tools in SAP, there are those tools in the world of Oracle and other systems, and they're all part of our plan for next year. Uh, some of the things that we're going to be spending some money on next year would be around uh, purchasing some additional uh, network monitoring tools so that uh, we can then divert staff time onto more value-added items. So that would be helpful. Um, going back to this, the whole share, uh, the share pointing, uh, I'm really happy to see that happening because I think from what you're saying, that should be able to actually reduce the time for the staff to evaluate and give approvals on things. I'm thinking sometimes of the engineering people and things like that who go back to, I get complaints all the time that you get a different engineer and they come up with a different thing and you have to change again and again and again and this holds up lots of different projects all across the city both city and developer ones not just will this sharepoint arrangement help to overcome some of those issues um i would take uh, us back to uh Councilor Tyranny's point which is that if you just implement sharepoint as is out of the box um, for most people it would be just a file sharing mechanism I have to send a big file, I can't email it to you, so I'll put it on SharePoint and you can get a copy from there. Uh, the real value of SharePoint, of course, is to make it part of your business workflows, and that won't happen automatically. Uh, and that is why I think we would need to, and we are already planning to, to bring in that external professional expertise so we can have many of those user groups uh, adopt SharePoint in its in its more optimal fashion versus just a file sharing tool. So that's a training exercise too, I take it. It's a training and it's also a bit of a, a process change exercise as well in terms of how people do business today and how they may do it differently once they have SharePoint. So where does that, that come? That has to come from, from senior management or from, uh, it, 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 you can get the technology there, but the people part of it, would that be more in Donna Gray's in your shop or, or is it something that is? I would say that, uh, Almost everything that you see on our 2018 work plan, in some way or the other, I'm connected very closely with Mark in SIPD. And so I think, of course, on SharePoint, because if you're talking about the business aspect of the, uh, the, the, the process, uh, I would be working very closely with Mark on that. Okay. I think that's really the important part of SharePoint, more than sharing the files, that the actual use of it as a tool would be, I can see it making huge inroads and probably a lot of my money because it will save a lot of time. Yeah, the, um, the, some of the, the open data portals and things, a bit of discussed about that, but it's, uh, I think that you're still continuing to add things to that carefully and things. I do have people complaining that, why don't you have this? Why don't you have that? I mean, they're, they're looking for things. And uh, I, the email came in this morning, I haven't got in front of me right now, asking for certain things to go on there, for example. If you haven't got that, we can forward it to you. But the uh, um, it, it just that I know that uh, mostly transport has been really helpful for getting when the buses are going to come and things like that. But there's lots of other things that we can get on that too. Yeah, uh, Councillor, I agree with you, and I, we are um, uh, set to start working on our release plans for uh, with departments um, early in Q1 in terms of the additional data sets that we plan to release for two. Um, but there's a number of data sets we feel that uh, uh, would be quite helpful, and so we're going to be working with departments on that uh, early into Q1. So we'd, be, we'd welcome the feedback uh, that you're receiving in terms of data sets that you feel residents might benefit from as part of that process. And I, I think Mr. Darwin was saying some of the things too, that you, you may put stuff on there, but it's not the quality control has to be there too to make sure that it, it's pretty accurate and, and that it's, it's fairly complete and fairly timely. That's a big issue. I have people complaining about owners, and I asked about that, and people say we don't even know that they've occurred because it takes about two years to get them into the system right now. That's probably connected.
police and everything else as well, of course. Correct. Some, some of those data sets um, are, are, can be quite sensitive in terms of personal information. We do need to work with, with our partners in making sure that we can release that data. But I did take note of uh, the presentation that Mr. Darwin and, and uh, I'll review with staff uh, any data quality issues that we might still be experiencing. Okay. And the other thing is that we have a lot of very good technology companies here. And Tim Tierney just mentioned the one in his area that's helping a lot. Are you actually, and the they're doing some really very advanced stuff. And uh, that fits into the whole smart city situation. And I know we've just had a, well, I think a kind of an inadequate report on that. It's gonna take a long time and smart cities have to move faster than that. And it's more than just technology. It's how you in, in got people involved. Uh, every conference I've been on about this, I said the most important thing is the involvement of the community and how you'd bring these things forward to make them meaningful in the end. How is that working between getting what you're doing in technology into the system? So we'll have the technology we need to get the th all the things done, and not just the raw technical stuff, but the people part too. Um, Councillor, if I understood the question correctly, you're talking, uh, you're referencing how do we engage the local talent that exists in, in the city in terms of some of and the... And as part of the whole concept of the smart city, which yes. we're embracing, which most cities are now, but it can be done in different ways. And right. I think the key of it is to have it much more universal than just technical. Uh, so on the um, how do we get the local technical talent engaged, uh, I'll answer that first. Um, my network from my previous role uh, has been quite upset at me because they want us to talk about all the things that IT is doing at the city so that they can uh, participate in it perhaps. And so we are planning to do an information uh, session, a very detailed one for uh, all the companies, whoever wants to show up, but uh, we are hoping that lots of local talent, local technical companies are going to come and see uh, the projects that we have in our world for the next three years and see if there are interesting things that we can uh, pilot using, using them. Uh, in terms of the smart city, Councillor, uh, as you may be aware, um, IT is, is in a supporting role uh, for, for all the smart city initiatives that are economic development. Um, I am not sure if, uh, Donna? Thank you, Mr. Chair. So as part of the smart city, and it's a component of the digital strategy too, we're working with Invest Ottawa um, around how can we use the local sector and um, local organizations <clears throat> to be able to put ideas out into the community business problems and look at how do we use that market to be able to develop solutions. So really creating uh, a broader group of individuals that are engaged in developing solutions. Some might end up in technology, some may end up in different models, d different business models about how we want to do the work. And that's really a core piece of what Mr. Darwin's talking about, our shift in the open data program, as well as, you know, before we have just been in a world of putting data up and then leaving it to the community to use it or to not use it. We've done different hackathons and different ways of trying that, but we'll really be shifting now our approach to be having dialogues and discussions with those groups who are active in the community using the data to have better understanding of how they want to use the data, what that products can result as, as um, um, based on the data, and then how do we improve other data sets that they need to come forward to create even more solutions. So it's the same approach that we want to do from data, from our business problems, and potentially from technology, is taking it outside of the administration and just the internal organization out into the community to co-create some of those solutions. So it's kind of like partnerships with the private sector and the individuals to try to, to do the new things that might be help, or at least to test things out. Yes, absolutely. And that partnership as well, Invest Ottawa already has a, an agreement signed with the federal government. So we're really looking at also doing kind of a civ tech where we have at every level of government also involved in that as well. Can we incubate and create solutions that are not just useful for our local level of government, but multiple city governments because we all kind of have the same business problems or business challenges using technology but also how can we leverage the federal government both their investments that they're making but also their business challenges as well and that will be a key partnership with Invest Ottawa around how we will do that. Okay. Now that sounds like be very very useful and that may lead some of these businesses to get other opportunities for building their businesses privately as well then with this kind of a partnership. 
Absolutely, that's correct. And for them to be able to take the opportunity to scale it and potentially to sell it in the marketplace more broadly. Okay. There's lots of other things we could ask about, but I think those are some of the ones that I wanted to raise. And I do appreciate the, the work you've put into this. And, the, and the, by giving us the information about how you've uh, done, done everything, I think the cybersecurity particularly is so important. And it, there's lots of people experts in that in this city. So it's uh, the fact that you've been able to catch these things before they get right into the whole system is, is excellent. Thank you. All right, thank you, uh, Councillor Drews. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I, uh, and thank you very much for the good presentation. I just, uh, I touch a little bit on the presentation that you're talking about uh, investment and training in employee. Can you elaborate a little bit on uh, what this is going to do to your team, which is, it's a good idea that you're training staff, and uh, as you know, technology moves fast, and we need to be always keep current technology. And is this is a, can you explain a little bit, is it going to be cost saving for our city concerning consulting and what? Uh, thank you, Councillor. So the long list of benefits in terms of uh, giving adequate technical training to staff. You know, one simple one is uh, job satisfaction. You know, you just imagine the people who work in IT at the city of Ottawa are surrounded by technical innovation happening in their own city. And, uh, uh, I, you know, it, it would be a big uh, you know, job satisfaction angle to make sure that the people who work in IT shop at the city also speak the same language. So, so that uh, itself is creating a big boost in morale of the employees in terms of giving them the training. Uh, the other one is, uh, is around productivity. Um, some of these tools that we are getting people trained on are, uh, are eliminating the, the manual laborious exercises that people perhaps were doing in the past. Uh, so that, of course, is helping as well. Uh, the other is that we often, uh, you know, some, not often, but sometimes we could be getting a professional person to come in to do a project for us, but once they leave, they leave with that knowledge. Uh, I think it would be in our interest to make sure that our employees are trained so that they can speak with those professional expertise at their level, and once the consultant leaves, that we can carry on that work. Uh, you know, on all of those fronts, technical training is proving to be really useful. Uh, the, the technical training platform I mentioned is just one of a few different things that we have done. Um, for example, the SAP team has access to the SAP Learning Hub, which is an, a premier online resource as well, and, and a number of other things. I want to congratulate you on this, this attitude. Uh, and this is an initiative, I'm sure, that uh, your department in the future implementation of softwares or every uh, every aspect of business we do in a city or we're just on one specific uh, project? Um, for as long as I'm in this position, the IT team at the city of Ottawa will be getting a lot of technical trading, whether, whether they like it or not. Thank you. <laughs> so. Uh, I appreciate it. And do you see that, uh, I understand and I respect the investment and I like your answer, but uh, do you see that it's going to help us in the future to save and cut costs in consulting and how do you see this shaping up to the future? Uh, the short answer is definitely yes. It will save us in some consulting cost in the future. Uh, thank you. Can you next year maybe when you come back to this uh, committee that maybe we'll have some uh, an, uh, benchmark and some uh, some numbers that we can really relate to, and maybe, hopefully, that most department will start thinking that way. I really appreciate it. Certainly, Thank much. Sorry. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, I have another question unrelated to the budget, but I would probably I will I will ask you. Uh, I notice uh, lately we've been tethering on our new devices, and I know you, we've done the deployment in our devices, and most uh, the city now moved to Samsung and iPhone. I noticed that when we tether on our devices, we have some charges. Can you probably will not have the answer for me today, but maybe can you come back to our to the committee or give us a memo offline that uh, sometimes in that we need to tether to our devices spe specifically if our laptop in the city or something we don't have coverage or Wi-Fi, it will be helpful because right now we're getting dinged for it. 
Councillor, I can certainly put the details in the memo, but the short answer is yes, we will be able to provide that ability. Uh, the current contract we have with the uh, provider of data services uh, does not allow us to do that unlimited device-to-device uh, -device connections, but uh, there's certainly a possibility that we have already started to pursue, uh, and I fully expect that uh, early in the new year, you know, January, February time frame, we would be able to make that possibility available to you and others. Thank you, Mr. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, going back to the security issue, so we have 20 billion perimeter log events, and that ends up boiling down to 18 uh, cases requiring detailed response. I assume a lot of that is patch or something else. And then you have 16 million access to malicious websites and 1,600 attempts to compromise the city system, and that's all in a three-month period. So what stands between that and very bad times here is you and CGI. So uh, what I was gonna, going to propose or ask is if Councillor Tierney could set up a small tour for the committee of CGI so we can, sure. that's a yes? Yeah, absolutely. Committee, okay. It's so, it's, yes, it's worth seeing, especially when you see these numbers. All right, so um, we'll give direction to do that then. Instead, okay. the staff is back to me, but yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, he knows them, so he can set up. All right. Uh, other questions? Yes, Councillor Reaper. Thanks. I, uh, I don't have a lot uh, this morning. Uh, first off, Saad, though, uh, thank you very much for the work over the past year. Um, I have appreciated that it has been a, a low drama year. Um, you've accomplished a fair bit without it uh, uh, becoming um, uh, drama over the so that's uh, much appreciated, very, uh, very competent. Uh, a couple of quick questions for you. Uh, in the capital budget, there is or, uh, uh, the, the expenses. There is the elimination of $309,000 worth of overtime that was spent in uh, 2017. We're not anticipating spending it in 2018. Um, can you just get some color around why that line item isn't in there? Councillor, overall, um, I have uh, uh, been pushing uh, in terms of taking a hard look at the overtime uh, and the on-call um, processes in IT. And so it's not one particular area of IT. It's uh, sort of the dollar amount is made up of uh, several different aspects of IT that uh, you know, we would have in the past paid for overtime and on-call. And sometimes, you know, the thinking may have been in the past to be better safe than sorry, let's have uh, a few people of each group to be available on call so that in case something goes wrong, uh, we, can, uh, we can depend on those folks. Um, so, so there has been an added focus on my behalf to bring that number to more in line with only having on-call staff where they're needed. Okay. Uh, by implementing some automation, uh, by uh, also having the 24-7 service desk, you know, we have had a few different business processes that we have also implemented this year that have helped us get more confidence that we don't need to have a high number of staff on-call available. Okay, and it's, I mean, it's not obviously a huge amount of 309,000, I think, but um, uh, it's, it's still reasonably significant. Uh, one of the things that has, uh, your, your department has been looking at for a couple of years now is making sure that the rest of the organization is going through you before making technology procurement. Uh, using applications. Um, how is that working? Uh, are we still seeing uh, other departments who are, who are doing technology implementations on their own, or are you being successful at funneling the requests through your shop? Uh, Councillor, the uh, way around that is that uh, we have had to reestablish and rebuild, in many cases, good relationships with folks around the city that have to do something related to technology. You know, a good example is OC Transport has a very well-defined technology shop, and we have an extremely close working relationship with them. You know, I'm finding that, uh, especially in the last 12 months in 2017, I have not come across a case where a independent technology group in the corporation has tried to do something significant without our knowledge. Uh, we are keeping a very close tab on everybody else's work plans, and we're also visiting them and being part of their strategic work plan exercises as well. Uh, so uh, I feel confident that we are on top of the other things that might be going on outside.
it's uh, on shop. Okay, well, keep that up because that's uh, that's an important part of uh, uh, meeting some of the risk uh, that has financial implications as well. Um, Mr. Darwin was asking about um, the uh, open data uh, as a line item and, and one of the frustrations everyone has with the way the budget is presented is we have lots and lots of detail on capital projects, very little insight into how the money is spent on the operating side. Just looking for some assurance from you that the resources that are allocated to the open data um, are going to remain the same, that uh, there's no uh, reduction or anything in those contemplated? Yes, that's, that's correct. Okay. Um, it would be interesting actually to get a, a breakdown um, offline even at some point of what are the uh, resources that we allocate to that, what are the costs to the city. Uh, I'm assuming that it, there's a, a really high ROI on that, but um, uh, it would be interesting to take a look at. A uh, couple of, uh, oh, uh, one other uh, higher level question. Uh, one of the things that we were taking a look at for a few quarters was um, that big app replacement um, uh, spreadsheet. We have enterprise applications uh, that are at various different stages in their lifestyle. Uh, is it your intention to come back to us at some point with an update on how we're doing replacing those? Uh, Councillor Lieber, there was a, a, a summary of that program that we shared with the committee uh, sometime in August, I believe, as part of a memo. Uh, certainly happy to come back and do a little bit more of a detailed deep dive onto any of those. Uh, just in terms of high levels, we are talking about uh, um, 21 uh, business applications are ongoing this year that are being life cycled, and there are another 18 of them that are slated for next year. All of those are listed by departments in that memo, but again, when I come back again, I can do a, a more detailed discussion on that. Thanks, I'll be interested in, uh, in taking a look at that. A couple of very small questions. Um, Geo Ottawa Light, so we, we talked here about the, the upgrade to Geo Ottawa. Geo Ottawa Light that's available on things like tablets, I don't think it's available yet, or at least I haven't been able to access it. Uh, where are we in terms of a launch for that? I was hoping that I could do this whole thing without counting on one of my folks, but I'm going to ask uh, Jason if he can uh, come in and talk about it. Uh, so as far as Geo Ottawa Light, we actually have rolled it out to a number of areas. Internally, we've set those up. Uh, we're testing those out for various business areas, so we're saying you know, it's very targeted to say, okay, you know, this is for infrastructure, what data sets do you need versus what we have currently on Geo Auto, which is, you know, approximately 200 different data sets on that site. We have, um, if you look on Ottawa.ca, you're actually seeing embedded within Ottawa.ca the Geo Ottawa Lite uh, application. So you can go on there now and you'll see um, a number of locations, um, thinking in the development applications, Geo Ottawa Light is there. So anywhere you're seeing those, those embedded sites with the map, that is the Geo Ottawa Light. So we're also looking at deploying some of those uh, through the mobile. So we're working on that right now so that when you go in through the UEM browser, you can see those things on a mobile device. And those are internal. So one of the, the frequent things I do when I'm at, uh, for example, my, my, my coffee shop pop-ups is, you know, someone will come in, I want to take a look at the zoning on their property or the, the neighbor across the street. Um, when will I be able to do that? On an well, iPad. Yep. Yeah, so that's what we're working on. So that's the full-fledged Geo Ottawa. So what we're doing is we're moving that out because that was a flash-based system. Yep. So we're moving that into basically new technology. It's, we're working on it right now, we're probably about 80%, so I don't have a firm date, but we are releasing that in 2018. So that will be okay. fully available to the public on mobile devices. 2018, I'm gonna hold you that. Okay. Uh, and then the uh, second one uh, is just start live streaming. Where are we at and maybe um, uh, in terms of making sure that you know we're 100%, all of our meetings uh, are, are up on YouTube? Councillor, I'll uh, ask my colleague Lee Fell to talk about some of the live streaming options that he's working on. My impression is it's still a little bit spotty. I know there were some questions yesterday as people were trying to access uh, the live stream for planning committee. Sure. Um, so we do have two live streaming kits available today that fully integrate with, integrate with Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Yeah. 
Um, we've run several successful events using those kits, including the Mayor's Light Rail Phase 2 uh, event um, several months ago. And that was, um, that was excellent. Yeah, so th those are available today um, and can be requested, and we can certainly uh, provide those for an event uh, at your convenience. In terms of uh, the, the legislative agenda, though, Planning Committee, City Council? In terms of uh, that particular software that runs those, uh, those, those live webcasts, uh, that solution is being replaced. Uh, there's a procurement process that is currently going on and the idea is to have a much more robust solution in place next year. Okay, because one of the nice things about the, um, uh, particularly YouTube, is that it's going to be that transcription um, solution that we're looking for as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm keen to see, uh, keen to see that our legislative meetings are uh, being live streamed on those platforms that offer uh, tools like transcription. And, and Councillor, when I come back again uh, and we talk about the various software applications being life cycled, I can uh, make a note to give you a more detailed update on what's happening with uh, the, the, the SIRE and the e-agenda application. Okay. Okay. Wonderful. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. I just have a follow-up question on the same. Okay, but next is Councillor. Okay, Councillor Wilkinson. On, on the live streaming, uh, some time ago we were, we were promised we were going to be getting a toolbox for live streaming for our own selves. I don't think I've seen that yet. I do live stream my town halls, but if I can make an improvement in how we do it, it would be nice. Yes, great question. So the two kits that I mentioned, we've been piloting them. It's been successful. Um, now that we've sort of proven that technology, what we plan to do is to replicate that into some kits that could be made available to you so that you could have them at your disposal. Yeah, I know we were promised that a while back, so when is it coming? That would be coming in Q1. Uh, oh, we have the kits. We do need to do some procurement to get additional um, units uh, to do the transcoding and the streaming of the actual uh, well, video. Rather than using my cell phone, I can use it a little bit clearer right there. That's right, yeah. Okay, good. That's good. Thanks. Councillor Tierney. Great. Uh, sorry, I'm not trying to suck up all the uh, nerd oxygen in the room, but um, <laughs> do do this because this is my... I enjoy this one. Um, I noticed that um, there's an investment being made in SAP. I also, again, have a background in that too, back 15 years ago, and know the importance of it. Uh, what, what are some of the key uh, items that are going to be changed in it? Because my understanding is our system uh, with this upgrade is going to make some significant uh, business changes just by making, making these upgrades. Councillor, uh, what is planned in terms of SAP upgrade for next year consists of a couple of things. Uh, the one big item is to upgrade the actual database which is behind the scenes. Uh, that database, that piece of software that runs that database is going end of life. So um, every client of SAP who is using that particular current version uh, is now going to go to HANA and uh, we're doing exactly the same. Um, what happens once you go to the HANA platform are a few benefits that can be realized by the business. Uh, one is that you get a lot more Fiori apps available to you, mm -hmm. uh, hundreds of Fiori apps. And Fiori apps, if you think of them, they would look and feel very much similar to a, uh, an app that you may download on your iPhone. Uh, but it allows you to, to do certain functions within SAP without actually going to that very old SAP look and feel that many of us think about when we think of SAP. The other thing we us to do is uh, really shorten our processing times. It will make the system a lot more efficient. And so staff in IT who spend a lot of time on a daily basis uh, doing SAP uh, batch jobs, those types of activities are going to now be uh, done in a much faster way. And the third thing is that it will also allow us to take uh, advantage of some data analytics pieces of uh, SAP HANA that are going to be made available as well. Uh, that is the extent of the work next year. Um, of course, uh, you know, there are business changes that uh, various user groups of SAP might be undertaking next year, um, you know, in terms of going to success factor for, uh, for HR or for Ariba for procurement. Uh, that is outside the scope of the 2018 work that we have in front of us. That will be led by the various user groups on. Great, thank you. And um, uh, I know we started this initiative a while ago. Uh, VMware and virtual servers uh, to be able to make it so it's, you know, we can always be up at the correct patch levels. We're, we're still moving in that direction, trying to virtualize many of our servers? Uh, the short answer is if you want a detailed answer, I have an expert sitting No, there. no, I, I don't want to put people to sleep. Okay. Uh, and, um, 
uh, last but not least, all this talk of Russian hacking and, and meddling in elections, um, this upcoming municipal election, is there any uh, of our election-related devices that are connected to the internet in any way, or, or are we, or is this information that is provided back to City Hall, uh, called back to the central hub? I'm, I'm looking, I'm seeing some of our clerks over here kind of um, scratching their head. I but can, the, I can talk that. about the technology aspect. So, um, we are, uh, there are multiple um, applications that are connected to the elections program. Uh, there's hardware that is attached. There's network connectivity because you have to send the results from the polling stations. Um, all of that is being analyzed and worked on uh, to make sure that uh, we are well protected when it comes to security. Um, so that is a big part of our work plan. Uh, I would say that uh, if further information was required there in terms of what are some of the security we are putting in place around those systems. Uh, I would be happy to maybe do a more of a uh, you know in camera or in person type of a briefing so that uh, you know we can share those details with. And that's wonderful. And again, I think it's I don't think we're subject to that, but you have to be prepared and ask the question that we have the appropriate policies and pr procedures that uh, whatever takes place within a voting location is verified on the other side, which I'm, I'm looking at the clerk shaking his head saying, yes, we have those procedures and I think that's what we need to make sure we check a box and say we've done that. Um, just to, in wrap up uh, on, on a lot of these topics, I want to thank you because I know you inherited uh, quite a big beast and I'm seeing a lot of efficiencies. I'm seeing change in business applications that improves uh, how we do our business here, makes things quicker, which means more free time to be able to deal with the residents, as well as uh, greater support for security. All these things, uh, whether it's uh, yourself or the entire team, uh, are making a big difference. I'm noticing the last year specifically, it's been a dramatic change, so thank you for that. All right, well, as, as I look at our budget here and our uh, ask to council, we're asking more than the 2% that uh, is in vogue in other um, departments and other committees, but a big chunk of that relates to security. And so I guess the question, I just wanna hear you say it, is that uh, this is enough money to do those essential security operations and we will get them done and we're not, leaving or out or underestimating anything so that uh, we would by any chance go over budget on it. Uh, Mr. Chair, we have, uh, with this proposed budget increase, uh, the sufficient dollars that we need to implement all the various security initiatives that we have in mind. All right, thank you. So uh, any uh, debate on this? No, okay. So carried. carried, it's yeah. carried. Thank you. Now we have the, the IPD motion by uh, Councillor Leeper. Oh. <laughs> uh, uh, that Information Technology Subcommittee recommend the Council sitting as committee of the whole approve the ITSC portion of the 2018 draft operating capital budget, including amendment page 4, additional pages 10A and 10B, and amended pages 10 and 11 as one information so technology services subcommittee as follows a uh, ITS operating resource requirement page three of the ITSC budget book and B ITSC capital budget amendment amended page four of ITSC budget book individual projects listed on page nine and additional on and B so carried yeah, okay. carried now you need motion you should read that I know we uh, we said we were going to lift it, but just to uh, form. Uh, so first to um, uh, discuss it pursuant to subsection 89.3 of procedure bylaw 2016.377, uh, the information technology subcommittee. Um, oh, oh, sorry. To waive the uh, rules pursuant to subsection 1.2 of procedure bylaw 2016.377, the information technology subcommittee approved that the rules of procedure to allow for the consideration of the item listed as information previously distributed. Update on citizen services management system replacement 311 mobile application. Okay. Right. And then pursuant uh, to section 89.3, the information uh, subcommittee approved the addition of the following item for consideration by the subcommittee at today's meeting. 
on citizen services management system replacement through one mobile app. Councilor Wilkinson. Um, I was interested in this, Mr. Chairman, because this was the thing we wanted to have it in the both the 311 and the um, the way in which we use this for Matt, as a way of making our operations more efficient with the um, having mobile devices and things like that. I just was more interested. They said that the things that are as being done now, and I know some of the departments have this now, but they still have some that are doing things pretty manually. I was just wondering how much of this is actually now implemented and what's happening with trying to get the mobile devices everywhere where we have staff who are in the field and have to go back to the office probably ever uh, because they can get everything down there, they can photograph it, they can send it back, all of this. Is this all actually now working because that's what it was promised to do? Well, there's a number of staff now that are mobile enabled in the field and uh, we continue to have plans to mobile enable more employees in the field. It, uh, to my knowledge, it's working quite well um, and it's allowing much more responsive operations, much faster access to the core systems. Um, I think the way forward is to continue to leverage that to, uh, to, have, to, to be able to, to more quickly uh, you know, address service requests or other what requests. What operations are doing it now? Which operations? I know the bylaw was doing it and the uh there's some others that were coming on. I'd, I'd have to get the full list of, uh, I know that I, I believe forestry has uh, has also now gone live uh, with a mobile application, but I'd have to get back to you with a list of the uh, the actual operations that uh, have gone live with a mobile application in the field. And does that use GPS to locate where they are and everything else? You've got the specific location that you can then track in our system so somebody can go online and find out that the pothole they reported at a certain place has been fixed at that location? Is it, is, is it the public able to access that information back to, or is it just within the departments at this point? Yeah, I think the, the, the pothole example isn't quite enabled yet, I believe, but um, uh, for the mobile devices that are in the field, uh, there's GPS capability in those, uh, in those devices. But can anybody access that? Is it part of the open data or not? Uh, you mean publicly at, the, uh, at this point? I, I don't believe so, no. Not from uh, an operations perspective, no. Is that planned in the future? People are awfully interested in some of this kind of information. No, understood. And I think, I think we'd have to review the text of kind of privacy, confidentiality, and operational integrity and just understand if we could potentially open up that data. But my understanding is there might be some limitations around what type of data we could potentially Maybe open up as a result of that. There's certainly some things that there's a tree in a certain location, you can, that's kind of public, you can see it. There could be uh, examples, you're quite right, where that's not an issue and that we could expose the data, but we'd have to look at that on a case-by-case -case basis. All right, pr proced procedurally, though, we have to vote on uh, Councillor Looper's motion. Did we not know? I thought we did. Yeah. No, I thought so, it carried. Carried? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The, the first item was the citizen services management software. Is this what's on the website when you can go and just do things on the website, or what is that? The CSM is currently, what the one in use that we use now is Lagan. That's our technology. So that is the technology that takes all of our service requests and processes that with the back-end departments. So that's the kind of things that Mr. We had asked about during the budget then, that, that about getting the access and making sure it's correct, et cetera, et cetera. That's right. So this, the IPD speaks about lagging um, um, needed to be upgraded. Yeah. So we did that as, a, as an interim step. But CRMs now have much more fulsome capabilities that deal with a lot of the issues that we've been talking around, the interaction with the client and the back-end systems. And so that work we'll be doing, uh, Mr. René de Cotre, will be doing in terms of defining what those requirements are as part of the digital strategy moving forward. And will that enable, for example, when you're applying for things, you're getting a dog license and you're paying your taxes and you're applying for social housing or any of these things that right now you have to get the information in separately every time. You're duplicating it a lot. Is this going to allow information that once it's in the computer it can go from one place to another or is that a future look? I'll, I'll uh, defer to uh, Mr. René de Cotre to answer the details. 
Yeah, the the uh, council the the the, um, the expectation is we would put in a platform that can more easily deal with that information. So you're you're inputting the information once uh, to the extent possible, so that it, uh, it facilitates the interaction that any citizen or business would have with the city of Ottawa. So it's much more much more effective and in the back end we're also um, leveraging one kind of horizontal interaction platform to help us execute so the idea would be to simplify that process so it's not all I take it well it would it, we're looking at those requirements now in terms of the the kind of the next generation kind of digital uh, uh, customer relationship management system that we put in place but uh, that's part of the vision is to replace it with a system that could uh, more accurately uh, do that that's what you're looking at whether it would be a replacement to that city. Okay. Correct. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Well, all right. So we'll uh, hear from the delegation now if you want to uh, address us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, councillors. Uh, so, and thanks for adding this item to the to the agenda so I can uh, speak to it. So I, I just wanted to tell you my 311 horror story. Uh, didn't quite fit in the budget item, but I thought it, it might be relevant uh, to this. Uh, so um, back in the spring, I was going to all the centers games on a basis, and uh, I was passing by the the new expanded Campo Drive, which is a wonderful roundabouts and all that stuff. Uh, but the uh, staff hadn't removed the lane ends sign in a few places. The, the road used to narrow, it doesn't anymore, so the signs need to be removed. So uh, I filed a request uh, using the 301 online application. Um, weeks went by, nothing happened, the signs were still there, my request was closed. I don't know what's going on with it. Um, I, I put it in a category called, um, you know, issue in road easement, I think it was, because, well, the sign's on the easement, so that seems to be where it goes, but there's no sign uh, in the online system. So I, I know now that I use the wrong category, but the right category wasn't available then. Um, so after a few weeks, I called the 301 office because that's the only way to get an update on a ticket. Um, I'd rather not call if I don't have to because that spends a lot of staff time. Um, so I talked to, um, didn't seem to be aware of what was going on with my ticket. They couldn't figure out what the status was. Anyway, I spent um, an inordinate amount of time, I think 20, 30 minutes, on the phone with the, the operator uh, to uh, reopen provide all of the information about my tickets to make sure that they got in the right system with the right coordinates. Uh, I found out later one of the problems with, um, I was describing where the problem was. It's the corner of Campo and Journeyman Way, which is right across from the Tanger outlets. So the, the operator knew where that was, but I find it in the system because the road is actually not in the GIS system. So uh, you know, I'm providing exactly where it is, but they can't find it. Uh, it's still not there, by the way. The road is constructed, you can drive on it, but the road's not in the database. So um, anyway, after all that, um, the, the, there was you know, orange paint on the road, the sign got removed, my request was handled, it was, it was all perfect. Um, just, but it had to get in the right category in the first place. Um, and apparently, if I put it in the wrong category, the system doesn't work. Uh, unfortunately, I found that out after I already opened another 20, 30, 40 requests in the wrong category. And um, uh, I managed to, uh, I made a comment earlier about my request uh, about mishandling uh, of things uh, was put on the City of Ottawa website. Uh, after a few months, uh, I finally connected with Michael Wallet, who actually did a big thorough investigation of what went on, and pro he provided me a lot of uh, detail. Um, so, um, so thanks to him for, for doing this investigation. I'm still waiting for some more uh, information back. But uh, suffice to say that uh, I don't think that the, the, the Langan system is providing a uh, reasonable client uh, experience right now. Uh, on, on the 311 uh, API, um, which is also part of this report, um, I noticed that the, the way it was written it up, it seemed like there was some disappointment about the lack of the community on building applications. Um, and I, I want to express my disappointment back in that the, the, the number one thing that we need from a community perspective to build the applications to talk about potholes, for example, is uh, the latitude and longitude of where the pothole request is. It, 
you know, it's, it's not so uh, interesting to know that in Ward, there's 500 pothole requests open. It would be much more interesting if I knew it was at the corner of, you know, Campo and uh, Canal Avenue. Uh, so uh, I, I understand that there's, um, um, you know, privacy related um, issues. Um, and certainly, you know, if you're talking about um, neighbor noise complaint or something like that, you know, you know, you might want to not give the exact location. But when we're talking about potholes or uh, trees or something that's in the public domain, uh, you know, it'd be really nice to get the exact latitude, longitude. And in those other cases, just an approximate one. So more details than just what is the ward where the problem happens. Um, uh, the, the status of the 301 issues are still not accurate. Um, so things are marked open that are actually been closed. So if we look at the, the data, we can see, you know, right now there's, uh, I don't know, 1,500 road maintenance issues that were open in 2016, which are not resolved yet. I don't know, are they really not resolved? You know, if there was a pothole reported in 2015 and it's not fixed yet, is that really still a relevant request? You know, I'd like to build an application that shows a dashboard of what the what the issues are, but I can't with the with the data. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Do there are there any questions for the delegation? Um, Just real quick, uh, Matthew, uh, you seem to be in technology. Um, are you using Android or iPhone by chance? Uh, Android. Perfect. Have you had the Pinpoint 311 application that we're testing out right now? I, I have used the Pinpoint, one, uh, Pinpoint 301 application. Okay. Uh, however, I stopped using it because it doesn't uh, allow me to put my email address in so that I can find my request later. Right. right. So uh, I provide that feedback to the Pinpoint uh, folks. They said they were working on adding that, so once they allow me to enter my email address uh, so that then I can find my request later, then, um, then I'll start using it again. Okay, because I think you'd be one of our uh, knowledge users that could actually help us assist because we are actually testing this product. It was something that I kind of, uh, this committee actually, not just me, put uh, to, we, you know, having an app. The day of going on to a, a, a full-size computer, well, those are behind us. So uh, if you can please continue to provide that feedback to staff, I think that'll be very helpful. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Wilkinson, did you want to? No. Yes. <laughs> Fantastic. So that's the, uh, the update. Uh, that was just an IPD. Um, are there any not most notices or motions for consideration at a subsequent meeting? None. Any inquiries? Yes. None. Um, in that case, a uh, motion to adjourn? Oh, uh, any uh, other business? No. Nope. Motion to adjourn. No. Carried. Thank you very much.